You know, a lot of people like Factorio. It is a genre pioneering game that can be milked for countless hours of factory building fun. Some also like it a bit too much and could compare it to a certain addictive substance that shall not be named. Yeah, I fully agree, because I once made that mistake and paid the price. But I went to Factorio Rehab, got my ass clean and was given the privilege of starting over and getting my life back on track. But I went ahead and got my ass addicted to something far worse instead. Mindustry is a tower defense factory builder RTS abomination of a game which is somehow way more accessible yet just as deep as its most common comparison, Factorio. You start off as a little drone in a hostile world and by the end you are a bona fide superpower with enough might to destabilize the solar system. If you decide to pick up this game, you will see your life waste away before your very own eyes. And to make it so much worse, it has co-op multiplayer that actually works out of the box without any server hassles. This is an idiotic guide to my industry. Because if I have to suffer this addiction, so will you. Since you just watched that intro and have a brain, you probably already have an idea of what kind of a game this actually is. Mindustry is a textbook case of indie genre thrown into Blender syndrome. But instead of just copying Factorio but making it 3D or in space, this tiny ass game actually does a lot to set itself apart. A common criticism of indie factory games is as wide as an ocean, yet as deep as a puddle. In that case, Mindustry masquerades as a bucket which happens to be hiding an eldritch monstrosity. Deception is not the right word I would use to describe it. Reverse catfish? Maybe? Going in, I expected very little. Instead, I found a game so complex yet fast-paced that I lose the little bit of self-control I have left as soon as I turn it on. Mindustry is an all-in-one RTS tower defense and factory builder that somehow manages to not skip on any of those individual aspects. It has the depth of a game like Factorio, the tower defense gameplay of those old Warcraft TD maps, and a slightly dumbed down version of the RTS gameplay of Supreme Commander. If you enjoy all three of those aforementioned games, Mindustry is going to be poison injected straight into your veins. The gameplay loop is as follows. This is your core. The core serves as the literal heart of your operation. Its job is to pump resources around your factory and to keep you alive. Anything and everything you could possibly ever manufacture has to enter this little cube in order for you to be able to do anything with it. Simple, right? Oh wait, this is a tower defense after all, so you are obviously going to need to protect yourself, and those defenses coincidentally need to be supplied with ammo. So now you have to worry about a military budget which just got wasted by a gun line going for 10 seconds. More enemies mean more guns. But in order to get bigger guns, you need ever increasingly complicated resources and ammo, which further in turn requires even more bulk resources. And then just when you thought you were done, now you need to conjure forth even more shit to fuel your endlessly hungry unit production lines. Congrats, you are now trapped in a downward spiral of never-ending belt spaghetti and sub-factories which will evaporate from your memory within 10 minutes of you building them. My industry does not have a difficulty curve. It has the fan curve of a single fan GTX 1060 being used to mine crypto. First mission is a walk in the park. Third mission, it's a bit tricky. Sixth mission is very difficult. And by the tenth, your entire existence will be consumed just by the need to survive. A single belt placed incorrectly. A router destroyed by a stray bullet. A single aircraft slipping by your air defenses. One spark on a cold transfer belt. Any number of things can go horrifically wrong at any time and any one of them will cause a complete disaster. If you only got one brain to rely on, you are liable to suffer a stroke. For the more casual player, there is fortunately always the option to call on the help of friends via the use of multiplayer. Unfortunately, that comes with its own long list of drawbacks, since having four people trying to think in parallel is one of the greatest exercises in futility humankind has ever conjured up. And then just when you finally manage to reach a status quo amongst the players replicating a Death of Stalin-esque political situation, 
one. Live, live. Jeez. You discover that this game has two completely separate game modes and you get to do it all over again. The gameplay on the purple planet consists of some more traditional tower defense factorio with some lighter RTS elements sprinkled on top. The orange planet on the other hand consists of an even balance between the different aspects and is generally a smoother experience. Okay, so I'm lying about that part and the orange planet is way more difficult than the other and will regularly have you dying of thirst. For the love of cheese, people, start on the purple planet first. Speaking of lacking something vitally important, bottlenecking. This game absolutely loves to give you a nice healthy helping of resources in one level, only to take them all away in the next. One particular level I recall, the game completely neglected to give me any sand on the whole damn map. Except for a tiny deposit, way the hell over there, in enemy territory. So I needed to stealthily pump my extremely mediocre supply of sand to a silicone factory where it would be processed under the table as to not piss off the enemy bombers continually looking to ruin my day. You see, something like this is a problem you will encounter on every single map under the damn sun. If it ain't sand, then it will be water, or titanium, or coal, or scrap, or really any number of possible resources you could ever desperately need. Unlike Factorio, you can't just go get more resources when you start running thin. There is a finite throughput of resources on any level, and when hostile bases are involved, you normally get the brown end of the stick. Work with the factory you have, not the factory you want. Transport. The act of moving something from here to here. On any level, this is a basic bitch mechanic that any factory builder should already be familiar with. Except this game has the forbidden fruit of transport mechanics. The oh-so-sweet yet devilish fruit known as the router. It takes an item from one direction and splits it out into three, allowing you to do some truly heretical things. That is, until your system starts clogging like a neglected shower drain. One word, indiscriminate. Just like the South African Postal Service, they do not care where your item comes from or where it is going. But they will sure as shit send it somewhere. I have wasted too much time on this mortal coil trying to debug why a line keeps clogging only to realize that a router was backlogged or a bridge conveyor was touching a belt inappropriately. You need to understand, clogs are a matter of when, not if. And in multiplayer, the former is so likely that you will get a money back guarantee from a sleazy salesman if you don't. My highest recommendation is using normal and inverted sorters to create fail-safes which will just cut off the supply if it detects any contaminants. If not, well, fuck, you get to rebuild the whole damn factory to get rid of the backlog caused by a single misclick 20 minutes ago. Speaking of sorting shit, Chair bombs, road flare. there are two exceptionally useful blocks that you'll be using on a very regular basis. Overflow and underflow gates. Unlike Factorio, your core will indefinitely consume items even if your stockpiles are full, the excess being subsequently destroyed, effectively pissing those valuable resources into the void, which could have been used to make units instead. Not good. To remedy this, you can use underflow and overflow gates to prioritize different parts of your factory over the core and vice versa. Unfortunately, my smooth brain refuses to use either of my engineering degrees to sort the shit out, so I just eyeball it and be done with it. On another note, save your blueprints. Time is not your friend, and by the end, it is gonna be your arch enemy. The faster you build, the greater the chance your sorry ass might survive. However, speed also incentivizes sloppy work, which if left unchecked, will prove your undoing. My recommendation? Get a few reliable yet scalable blueprints up and running for the basic shit. I'm talking your graphite, your silicone, metaglass, pyrotite, blast compound, etc. Because in a moment's notice, you're gonna need all of it all at once, and there will not be time to troubleshoot any shitty designs. Just don't go downloading hyper-optimized blueprints from the internet, or the Factorio gods will curse you or something. Now that you are a bona fide master of the arcane arts of moving junk, let's go over the defensive side of the coin. As you progress through the campaign, you will unlock a wide variety of defensive turrets. Overall, the turrets are pretty simple until they suddenly are not. You see, every non-electric turret in the whole damn game has the capacity to accept different ammo types which fundamentally change how the weapon functions. 
For instance, let's look at the Ripple, a mid-game artillery turret. You could load them up with dumb graphite shells to cop up on an area, or you could instead load them up with silicone, which enables point precision target tracking. Or if you're feeling especially rich, you can use more exotic ammo types to do some real damage. But before we continue, I feel I should set the record straight. Unlike Factorio, where your defenses serve to protect you from the biters while you pursue your final goal of escaping the planet, in my industry, your gun line is the only thing you should give a flying crap about. No gun is too big and no ammo is too expensive for the sake of your survival. I want you to pump that gourmet shit into every last one of your guns and blow that infernal guardian to chunks when it shows its ugly mug. But for the love of cheese, never put oil into a tsunami or wave turret. As if the ammo system was not complicated enough, there is also the question of cooling said weapons. Historically, weapons tend to get hot as you fire them. Some truly mind-blowing shit. But as any member of the PC Master Race will attest, air cooling is decent, but not that great. The obvious next step is to liquid cool the fuck out of that shit. And that is most definitely something you can do. Liquid cooling a turret allows it to reload substantially quicker, which means more shells downrange faster. But you know what? Water is just kinda lame. Now if you're gonna go big, go really big. Like liquid nitrogen big. Which happens to outright double the fire rate of whatever you pump it into. Say it with me kids, overkill does not exist. Unfortunately for us, you can't win most maps with a hostile presence using turrets alone. While artillery creeping is a valid strategy, it is also an egregious misuse of resources. The solution? Force projection in excess of theirs. Like any traditional RTS, unit factories can be split into land, sea and air. But any semblance breaks down once you discover that this game follows an additive manufacturing process i.e. a lot of wasteful bureaucracy. Any supplied factory can produce tier 1 units, except tier 1 units suffer from chronic disappointment syndrome. To compensate, additive reconstructors can be used to upgrade your crappy tier 1 units to tier 2, provided they are supplied with the exact resources they require to do so. Tier 2 units can then be similarly upgraded to tier 3 you get the idea. And since there are a whopping 5 tiers in total, you are going to need truly immense amounts of manufacturing capacity to get there. So best be prepared for a lot of spaghetti. On a separate note, you are positively going to get your ass handed to you on a very regular basis. This game is not for the faint of heart and you will often find yourself on the back foot or outright losing. Particularly, missions with hostile presences will eternally ramp up their assaults until you eventually buckle under the strain. If you can't break them in time, they will absolutely break you instead. But the dev was thankfully not unreasonable, so even if you lose a battle, the shattered corpse of your former base will remain behind. Meaning that when you do eventually return for round 2, you can just continue where you left off. After you fit the rather hefty repairable, that is. However. If you have gotten to this point, you will probably have come to realize something. Where once you were able to build self-sufficient communes capable of defending themselves, there comes a point where that approach just is not feasible anymore. In the latter half of the game, it is borderline impossible to locally acquire the insane number of resources needed to set up and operate factories capable of defending themselves from UFOs or walking bunkers. You are now in the big leagues and they will bring forth the wrath of the machine god on you until you are nothing but a smudge on the map. One word. Centralization. Just like the railway lines of old, launch pads are the key to evolving from a bunch of self-sufficient but barely connected sectors to a technocratic nightmare. To hell with socialism. We need cash and we need it now. You are gonna use overbearing taxes to pool every last ounce of material across your petty empire to a single sector. Your capital sector, so to speak. And there, you are going to build a suborbital launch station that makes SpaceX look like a hobby in comparison. Congrats, you now have a gun. A gun that does not fire bullets or shells, but blank checks. Any sector you aim it at effectively gets an infinite number of resources for as long as you keep it there. 
You are no longer a little warlord unworthy of attention. You are now an organized and centralized threat that lays claim to the whole galaxy. Go give him hell. Congratulations, you should now be able to fully conquer my industry without going hollow in the process. Since I don't want to spoil this amazing little game for anyone who might be interested, I'm going to cut it here. Time for the obligatory plug. As I am currently a not-so-proud resident of the Republic of South Africa, the power crisis down here is making the production of these videos exceedingly difficult, since I can only do so in my spare time and provided I actually have power. If you enjoyed the video, I greatly appreciate some feedback to make it worth the trouble. If this channel ever gets any traction, the first thing I'm gonna do is crowdsource a fucking generator. Thanks for listening to this idiot, and I hope to see you guys around again. Cheers.